Oil prices have surged again overnight to $92 a barrel for Brent crude. Diesel prices, they're rising even more, pumping inflation pressure back into the global economy. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ's Michael Whitehead talks about a massive shift happening in land use in Australia. The world's dairy cattle, the world's beef cattle, the world's animals need feed, and Australia has a great reputation for providing it. And in terms of other areas that could grow, we are even seeing potential expansion into some traditional non-grain areas, such as in the Northern Territory too. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, number one, oil prices jumped 2% to a 10-month high of over $92 US dollars a barrel for Brent crude. That's after OPEC forecast ongoing strong demand for oil for the rest of 2023 and well into 2024. But it's not just oil prices that are an inflation worry. Diesel, its prices are rising even faster. That's because Russia and Saudi Arabia supply the heavier types of crude that are used to refine diesel. And also Russia is a major refiner of diesel for Europe, or used to be. Both Russia and Saudi Arabia have just extended their production cuts for the rest of the year, and that's hitting diesel prices. Here's ANZ's senior commodity strategist, Daniel Hines. They were a big supplier of diesel, but also over the summer, you know, there was a real focus for refineries to drive or maximise the output of gasoline at the detriment of, uh, of diesel. And so we've come into this period now looking pretty lean with um, you know demand starting to pick up into the, the seasonal strong period of, of Q4. Number two, markets are in a holding pattern ahead of US inflation figures tonight and the ECB's decision on Thursday night and ahead of next week's Fed decision. ANZ's head of G3 Economics, Brian Martin, says one thing to watch in particular next week is the Fed's new economic growth forecasts. He says they're likely to rise, which means high interest rates for even longer. The economy is very resilient in the face of what has been the most rapid rise in interest rates in over 40 years. And the fact that the economy is holding in very well is great news for American households, it's great news for American businesses. But it just means that people have to reset and the FOMC has to reset what the equilibrium level of interest rates is. I think that means that interest rates need to stay higher for longer. Number three, New Zealand's government gave an update on its finances ahead of the election on October 14. It now expects to have to borrow an extra $9 billion over the next four years, and it won't be in surplus until 2026-27. Now, that's a year later than was expected in May when the budget was released. Here's ANZ senior economist in New Zealand, Miles Workman. The big surprise for us is that this downgrade to the fiscal outlook is actually hanging off what looks to be a very rosy economic outlook from the part of the Treasury. So what that suggests to us is that if downside risks materialise to the Treasury's economic forecast, well, these fiscal forecasts could be in for another downgrade further down the track. Number four, India's inflation figures out overnight were softer than expected. Annual inflation in August was 6.8%. It's down from a 15-month high of 7.4% in July. ANZ had expected a number of 7.3%, so 6.8, much better than expected. And it was worried about sticky prices for non-perishable foods such as rice. Actually, vegetable inflation fell to 26% in August from 37% the previous month, and cereals inflation in August fell to 12% from 13%. Number five, net migration to New Zealand hit a record high, 96,200 in the year to July. Here's Sharon Zollner, ANZ's Chief Economist for New Zealand, on what it means. The impacts of migration depend very much on who is coming, what their skill level is, and the same is true of people leaving. And unfortunately, in real time, that's actually really difficult to gauge. The Australian government's pretty keen for anyone uh, who can fog up the back of a spoon. Basically, they've made it quite easy for New Zealanders to get citizenship over there. Uh, But it's also true that New Zealand has made it incredibly simple uh, for people to move here. Um, So it's hard to know at this point uh, what the net productivity impact is. But uh, regardless of how highly skilled someone is when they come, there's always a steep learning curve. And any type of churn 
it can definitely be inflationary, and to, whether that's job churn or housing churn or rental accommodation churn. For a given level of net migration, more churn probably makes it more inflationary, and we're seeing a lot of churn at the moment. ANZ's Sharon Zollner there. Time now for our bonus deep dive interview. I grew up on a farm, and I'm always curious about how land is used, and there's been a huge change in Australian land use. I spoke to ANZ's Head of Beverage, Food and Agribusiness Insight, Michael Whitehead, to find out more. Now, just looking at the land use change over the last 50 years, um, what, what's been the major factor in the growth of grain uh, to the point now where it's equal with cattle as a land use and at the same time sheep has dropped away sharply? What's, what's behind the, all that? As you say, 50 years ago, grain acreage was way behind sheep and cattle acreage in Australia. Uh, And then those two saw a reasonable decline. Sheep plummeted when the government support went away and fell by two thirds to where it is now at about 60 million. Uh, And cattle were volatile. They also went down as more and more land went into grain to sheep at the start. They're gradually recovering, but absolutely, it is grain which is rising. Grain continues to have a very strong global demand, whether for food, whether for feed. And every time there's volatility in grain markets, it tends to be prices going up rapidly. They don't tend to shrink a lot. For global investors and even institutional and Australian big investors, grain is very attractive. It has less moving parts. There's less to go wrong. It's almost set and forget to to some degree. You put a crop in, you keep an eye on it, you do what you can, but it is not something that has as much potential for uh, things to happen. Grain also has greater efficiencies of scale. If you expand a grain operation, uh, you likely need not many more tractors, harvesters, silos and other things. If you expand livestock operations, you need a lot more equipment as well. So you're getting those gains. Uh, Two more points. Uh, Grain arguably has seen great advances from biotech and from technology gains. And particularly also, whether it's uh, trying to drought proof crops, whether it's growing different varieties of crops, they're leaping ahead. And the last one is possibly its adaptability. If you want to change your grain crop between wheat, between barley, increasingly to pulses, uh, perhaps to to other things you want to grow, you can do that on an annual basis. You can react to markets and conditions, and that's a lot harder to do with livestock. So there are a number of reasons driving that ongoing growth of grain as a percentage of Australian agriculture. How much runway is there left for growth of grain as a land use, uh, given that there seems to be plenty of demand in Asia as the middle class there grows? There is absolutely the potential for grain usage in Australia to grow even further. For example, if sheep numbers go down, and particularly in Western Australia, that land is likely to go into grain. Uh, And you may well see grain going into other livestock areas, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria as well. Uh, Because as you say, the demand increases to be there, not just for food, which is important, but for feed. The world's dairy cattle, the world's beef cattle, the world's animals need feed, and Australia has a great reputation for providing it. And in terms of other areas that could grow, we are even seeing potential expansion into some traditional non-grain areas, uh, such as in the Northern Territory too. ANZ's Michael Whitehead there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Wednesday, September the 13th. Catch you tomorrow for the latest on US inflation. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.